Crew says, Swiss 127, he had a UFO or a rocket, something almost hit him in my airspace. Military radar advisors, they are picking up an intermittent primary target behind you, in trail. Since the earliest years of man flight, pilots and astronauts from around the world have encountered UFOs high in our skies and beyond. This is Houston. Say again, 7. Now, many of their dramatic cockpit recordings, film clips, and stories have been made available for the first time. The UFO? <laughs> it's the Roswell crap again. UFO reports that we get from professional pilots are considered among the very best because of their knowledge of the sky. From never before released black box and control tower recordings. From commercial airline flights. Last year, Julie, you still see uh, traffic out there? Hell yeah. For the FAA, UFOs are real. They've been punishing pilots and covering up UFO reports for over 50 years. To never before seen astronaut reports and secret recordings in outer space as recently as 2005. We have an unidentified flying object. Many of NASA's top astronauts have already testified to seeing UFOs. As astronauts and pilots around the world report an ever increasing level of unusual activity in our skies. Big bright light on the front and a greenish tail coming out of the back. Many wonder, do the skies belong to us or to them? The report that was made last November 17th of a UFO spotted over Alaska attracted special attention. This sighting was made by an airline pilot with 29 years of experience. The crew claims that while it was flying over Alaska last November, it was followed for 400 miles by strange white, yellow, and amber light. Of the thousands of reported pilot and astronaut encounters with UFOs around the world, few are more harrowing than the encounter on November 17, 1986, by Japanese Airlines Flight 1628, high above the remote Alaskan tundra. Regarding uh, uh, airline cases uh, in, uh, in America, the GL is very interesting because you have multiple witnesses. It was a cargo aircraft and the pilots uh, observed an object that seemed to be tracking along with their aircraft. It involved an investigation by the FAA. This is an official government investigation of uh, the sighting itself. The events of that night were captured on tape. Spinner 1628 Heavy, military radar advisors, they are picking up an intermittent primary target behind you, in trail, in trail, I say again. The Boeing 747 cargo jet is on a routine flight from Paris to Tokyo, cruising at 600 miles per hour, at an altitude of 35,000 feet. It heads towards Anchorage, Alaska, to refuel. Suddenly, at 5.11 p.m., Captain Kenju Terauchi, a pilot with 29 years flight experience, sees three large, fast-moving, unidentified objects 2,000 feet below them. The largest object is described by Captain Terauchi as resembling, quote, a shelled walnut. Captain Terauchi describes the main craft as being twice the size of an American aircraft carrier. Co-pilot said it was as solid there as if you were seeing an oncoming jet with its lights on except it wasn't an oncoming jet. 747 was nothing compared to this uh, big flying saucer. After several minutes of observing the UFO, the pilots realize the objects are now matching their speed, 600 miles per hour, tracking them. The captain reports that the objects begin, quote, making moves that are impossible for any man-made aircraft to perform. Then, without warning, two of the smaller craft suddenly rise and shoot directly in front of the pilot's window, the objects come so close to the airplane that Captain Terauchi says the intense glow makes his face feel warm. All of a sudden they appear and they're traveling right in front of the aircraft. And they were sort of wobbling back and forth as they moved. They seem to be only a, th a thousand, maybe two thousand feet in front of the aircraft and traveling at six hundred and some miles an hour. At that very moment, the radio link to Anchorage goes dead, leaving the aircraft flying blind. A horrifying catastrophe is seconds away. But the UFOs rise and veer left. In his official FAA report, Captain Terauchi says, quote, we had to get away from that object. Uh, disappear, 
1628 you do not see the traffic any longer. Okay. Moments later, an urgent message comes in from Elmendorf Air Force Base. The unidentified object now appears on their radar. Yeah, there's one dash two again. We have confirmed there is a flight size of two around your one five five zero squawk. One primary return only. Okay, where is he following him? It looks like he is, yes. Okay, stand by. The phrase flight size of two indicates that JAL 1628 has uninvited guests with possible hostile intentions. Spinner 1628 heavy military radar advises they are picking up an intermittent primary target behind you. In trail, in trail, I say yes. Immediately after this confirmation, the FAA requests that the Air Force scramble jets. Do you have anybody to scramble up there, or do you want to do that? Oh, we're going to talk to your liaison officer about that. It's starting to concern that uh, Japan Airlines taking the 360 now, and it's still falling. Okay, we're going to we'll call the military desk on this. Although the military desk took no action, JL-1628 was able to land safely in Anchorage at 6.20 p.m. Extensive media coverage from around the world helped make this incident one of the most widely reported UFO cases in history. While the JAL case continues to inspire debate about the nature and intent of the objects that tracked the 747, to this day, the case remains a mystery. The Japan Airlines 747 had a saucer go around it. The papers mysteriously disappeared from the FAA office. January 30, 1987, only two months after the JAL report, a similar UFO event takes place in these same Alaskan skies. But this one involves the U.S. military. A U.S. Air Force KC-135 inbound from Elmendorf Air Base in Anchorage to Eielson Air Force Base southeast of Fairbanks reports a chilling UFO-related incident at 20,000 feet. The pilot reports that the object is strikingly similar to the UFO reported by the JAL flight, a massive, disc-shaped, noiseless object larger than an aircraft carrier. Seconds later, Anchorage Air Traffic Control asks if the KC-135 still has the object in sight. The pilot replies yes and says the object is now 40 feet from his aircraft. The recent incident involving JAL Flight 1628 even comes up in their cockpit recording. Thirty minutes later, the Anchorage control tower passes along a message from the regional FAA office. After uh, 2-9, the quality assurance staff at the Anchorage site here requests you give them a call after you land at Eielson. That is uh, concerning the uh, object we're looking at. Affirmative, sir. I think pilots make especially good UFO witnesses. They know what's normal in the sky and what isn't. Uh, they've seen all different kinds of airplanes routinely. When a pilot reports the UFO, there's a better than average chance that that's what it was. January 31st, 1987, less than 24 hours after the KC-135 encounter, yet another UFO-related incident occurs in the skies above Alaska. The pilots aboard Alaska Airlines Flight 53 reportedly witness enormous bright disc-like objects tracking their airplane. Ground control reports that no object is visible on radar, but it is the speed of the UFO craft that alarms the pilots. They had just underneath our radar picked up a blip. He's moving about a mile a second. He's pull out straight ahead of us and just disappear. Man, he was there and then he was gone. If you're a pilot and you report a UFO sighting to the FAA, you might as well turn in your license the next day. The FAA, the military, even civilian authorities don't want to know about UFOs. Pilot encounters with UFOs first surfaced in the 1920s and 30s long before black box and control tower tape recordings were possible. Sightings by pilots have occurred ever since the very beginning with Kenneth Arnold. Kenneth Arnold was uh, flying from Tehalis, uh, Washington, over towards Idaho. Somewhere around Mount Rainier, he uh, identified what looked to him to be about nine aircraft traveling in an east to west position. It was this man, Kenneth Arnold, from Boise in Idaho, who ushered in the era of the flying saucer. At this point is where I had this terrific flash. I looked way off here to the north, and that's when I saw where the flash came from. It was a, an echelon formation of a very peculiar-looking aircraft. The second craft from the rear had a more or less crescent shape, and, of course, I kept 
mulling in my mind. That's the damnedest looking airplane I ever saw. Upon landing in Yakima, Washington on June 24, 1947, Arnold makes what would become the very first civilian reports of UFOs to the government. He would describe the objects to reporters as appearing and moving like, quote, saucers skipping across the water. Somebody else twisted that around into the term flying saucer. That was the beginning of it. His official report made to the Joint Army and Air Forces Intelligence is seen here for the first time on television. Arnold describes the UFOs as thin, round in the front, and coming to a point in the back, and did not appear to whirl or spin. He watches as the craft flip and flash in the sun, and comments, the more I observe these objects, the more upset I became, as I am accustomed and familiar with most all objects flying. The Arnold case was extremely significant in that prior to it, there had been no talk publicly about disc-shaped shiny objects flying around. And we haven't been without UFOs or flying saucers ever since. Coming up, the skies above New England are rocked by three separate UFO encounters, all captured on tape. They got anything flying out in the area? They were on a fast turned over. Well, then I just had a couple of UFO reports. The Grand Canyon is a graveyard for 128 passengers and crew of two airliners which collided in a thunderstorm and crashed on peaks little more than a mile apart. The impact reduced the wreckage to carbonized smears of paint and metal. None survived. It was the worst commercial air disaster in history. While some experimental black box and pilot voice recorders were in use by the military during World War II, it was not until a catastrophic mid-air collision in 1956, about 200 miles due east of Area 51, that onboard recording boxes were mandated by the FAA. A major accident above Grand Canyon imposed the FAA and the NTSB to ask for all the airlines to be equipped with audio recording system. Since the mandate of cockpit voice recorders, hundreds of reports have been made of strange lights, near miss collisions, and radar tracking of unidentified flying objects. Three recent pilot recordings captured over New England have been obtained for this broadcast. They are presented here for the first time. One of the most fascinating cases is Lufthansa 405 out of JFK, November 18th, 1995, where they saw a UFO across Long Island. November 18th, 1995, while on a routine flight above Long Island, New York, Lufthansa Flight 405 and Airbus A340 out of New York en route to Frankfurt, Germany, makes a disturbing call to Boston Air Traffic Control. The pilots report an unidentified flying object passing within 3,000 feet of their plane. It took the, uh, on our tail about 10 minutes, uh, we passed it just uh, one minute ago, and it was looking straight. The UFO is described as a long cylindrical object with a white light on the front and a long green comet tail. The strange UFO is also seen by British Airways Flight 226, a 747 flying from London, and is just north of the object. The code name for British Airways flights is Speedbird. I actually would have a opposite traffic to those of the UFO. It did have a very strong vapor trail, which looked more like smoke, and the light on the front was very, very bright. And on terms of 405, how far off your side did that traffic pass? It was pretty close, and uh, like the speedbird said, it was looked like two or three thousand feet above on the left wing, just one mile, looked like a UFO. Boston Air Traffic Control contacts Giant Killer, the military fleet area control and surveillance facility that monitors restricted airspace over the Northeast. Giant Killer, they got anything flying out in the area? They got one of fast turned over. Well, then I just had a couple of UFO reports. Oh, is that right? I had a couple of guys that uh, reported uh, lights just going over their head. I had no, tra no traffic whatsoever in the area. They, they set a pass within a mile of them, like a 2,000 feet above them, opposite direction. Ah, or could have been a meteor or something. Hmm. Both pilots confirm the object has glowing lights. The object has a green vapor trail, not like any vapor trail they've ever seen. Both pilots immediately question the idea that the UFO they saw was a meteor. Well, that's a 405, so you, you would say that it definitely wasn't a meteor, right? Uh, I don't know, I don't know. That's, 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 I just do 
US 206 Barrack, it took a meteorite right, because uh, it was flying level. It looked as if it was going very quickly, it definitely looked faster than normal aircraft. It was uh, creating a straight line at one level flight. Number 226, thank you. We're looking into it, I mean, uh, we're, we're making a report. We really don't know what it was. And the military doesn't admit to anything flying tonight. While the authenticity of this recording is not in question, the FAA and both airlines have never commented on this mysterious incident over New England. Two years later, Boston would be the epicenter of yet another strange encounter between pilots and UFOs. But this time, the encounter would result in a near-miss collision. The incident was captured on tape by the aircraft's black box recorder. August 9, 1997. Swiss Air Flight 127 is a jumbo jet en route to Zurich, Switzerland. Pilot Philip Bobet and First Officer Kurt Grunder are at the controls. At 23,000 feet, Bobet will later report that his visibility was excellent with no haze and a clear blue sky until an unidentified craft enters the plane's airspace. The pilot immediately contacts Boston Air Traffic Control. Sir, 127, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. I don't know what it was, but it, it just overflew like like a couple of hundred feet above us. I don't know if it was a rocket or whatever, but incredibly fast, uh, opposite direction. It was too fast to be an airplane. Later in his official report, Bobet will describe the UFO as a bright white cylindrical object with no wings, similar to a white shark. Aviation writer Don Berliner filed a Freedom of Information Act request to obtain the FAA audio and written records of this incident. The Swiss Air case is significant because the object that was described is quite unusual and the people reporting it have excellent credentials. These are veteran airline pilots. Moments later, the Boston Control Tower contacts another sector operator who is about to take over the flight. Hey Chris, uh, Swiss Air 127, he had a UFO or a rocket something almost hit him in my airspace. A uh, UF, yeah, UFO or a rocket almost yeah, at the Swiss 127? Went, went right above them, two, about two or three hundred feet. The pilot's official incident report classifies the object as a UFO, categorizing its shape, color, and speed. However, the NTSB and FAA concluded the object seen by Swiss Air 127 was a weather balloon launched by the military at about the same time. These are not the kind of people who would be fooled by weather balloons because these are uh, fairly common experiences among airline pilots. It's really hard to mistake a weather balloon for much of anything else. These eerie sightings of UFOs are not isolated to the Northeast. In fact, sightings of UFOs by pilots have been reported across the country. On February 28, 1996, the skies over the Midwest are rocked by simultaneous reports of frightening airplane-like objects moving at incredible speeds. This case involves two commercial aircraft, Air Shuttle 5959 en route to Cleveland, and Misaba 3179, a Dash 8, heading from Detroit to Pelston, Michigan. This event was recorded by the Cleveland Tower. Cleveland Tower gets a report from an Air Shuttle flight coming out of Detroit that they've picked up a strange light very close to them. Nobody can figure out what the light is. Next, Cleveland Air Shuttle 5959, we see traffic out there uh, 12 to 1 o'clock, a uh, low altitude. Do you, do you have one there? Air Shuttle 5959, that's a negative, sir. I don't have anything out in front of you. Can you get an estimate on an altitude on him? Uh, we're in between layers here. I'm just going to estimate him. 2,000 feet below us, maybe, and uh, so sort of tall city light about, I don't know, 10 miles out. Is that northwest of Detroit? Did you see that light? Yeah. yeah that's what I saw, a real bright white light, sometimes flickered uh, underneath the cloud. Two reports from two separate aircraft, and both pilots describe the same bright pulsating lights between the cloud layers. Cleveland Air Traffic Control questions if the light might be a landing beacon. Air Shuttle 5959, is that traffic uh, that you saw earlier, do you see him out there any longer? Yeah, Air Shuttle 5959, uh, that's permanent. I don't know if we'll get closer to it or what, but it looks like a rotating light around it, uh, like a frisbee type thing that's going around it. So, the Sabah 3179, do you see the same thing? Uh, sir, I saw it coming out of Detroit. I wondered, uh, all I saw was just a couple real bright flashes of light, but it looked like it was underneath the cloud deck to me, maybe 10,000 feet. Well, would you think it might be like a reflection, uh, maybe perhaps off a beacon that for some reason it's just one of those weird things, uh, natural phenomena that, uh, you're getting a reflection? Because I got nothing out there. It's definitely, uh, a big whitish, uh, well, it's looking a little red and 
greenish light sort of pulsating, and it is consonant. It's not a beacon. The Cleveland Air Shuttle hangs a Huey, goes under the light, and now is looking at the light from underneath and says, absolutely not, Cleveland. We're seeing the light above us, probably at 5,000 feet. And Cleveland Air Shuttle 5959. Just to keep it advised, uh, we're descending to 4,000 feet right now, and as we descend it through 10,000 feet, that object is above us right now. It is not on the ground. It's about 10,000 feet. I'll tell you what, that is weird. It's just sitting up all day. I'm trying to do a little investigating as to what this might be, and if you would keep me advised on this. Okay, sir, I'm going to point my light up and see if I can get any action on it. Masaba 3179, when you flashed your lights, did you get any response? It appeared to, sir. Okay. A double pilot sighting caught on radio that you would never hear because the media never covered it. Coming up, another UFO double confirmation. This one involving an America West jetliner and NORAD. This guy definitely saw it run all the way down the side of the airplane. It's right out of uh, the X-Files. And later we'll analyze evidence of UFO sightings during NASA's Apollo moon missions. On May 25, 1995, an exceptional UFO-related event occurs more than seven miles above Earth. An enormous, fast-moving UFO was witnessed by an America West Airlines crew. What makes this incident a watershed in black box recordings is that it is one of the first on record to reportedly involve a government agency NORAD, the government's watcher of the North American skies. This uh, 1995 uh, America West Airlines case, the government got involved briefly. Somebody with air traffic control told the crew, one of the crew members, that they had been in touch with NORAD, which had briefly confirmed radar tracking of something in the area, and then later denied it. The Air Force confirmed that there was an object and especially in the NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command. Yeah, we detect something. America West Flight 564 is flying from Tampa, Florida to Las Vegas, Nevada. Captain Eugene Tollefson and First Officer John Waller are in control, cruising at 39,000 feet above Bovina, Texas. All is normal until 10.25 p.m. when the pilots see a UFO just below them at 30,000 feet. The actual recordings between Flight 564, Albuquerque Air Traffic Control, and NORAD were recently obtained by the History Channel. Okay, Captain, Flight 564, say again. There's nothing on their radar on the other antennas at all on that uh, particular area, that object that's up in the air. Uh, it's up in the air. A permanent. What's the altitude about? I don't know, probably right around 30,000 or so, and it's... Uh, drill that starts from going uh, counterclockwise, and uh, the length is unbelievable. The pulsating object is reportedly over 400 feet long, yet invisible on radar. This prompts air traffic control to contact a nearby Cannon Air Force Base radar operations in Clovis, New Mexico. Cannon, go ahead. Hey, guy at 39,000 says he sees something at 30,000. The, the length is unbelievable and it has a strobe on it. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what does that mean? I don't know. It's a UFO, so it's the Roswell crap again. The crew that saw it described it as a long, thin object, cylindrical, with a series of lights down the side, blinking on and off in sequence. They saw a cigar-shaped object flying with strobing lights on a length of uh, uh, roughly 300 feet, which is quite uh, big. Seconds later, an Air Force F-117A Nighthawk from the 49th Fighter Wing at Holloman Air Force Base is alerted by air traffic control. The stealth fighter sees something. Okay, five in the next two to three minutes, be looking off to your right side. If you see anything about 30,000 feet, one aircraft reported does something. It wasn't a weather balloon or anything. It was a long... Um, White looking thing with a strobe on it. Let me know if you see anything out there. You got any traffic off our left wing right now? Nah, I've got some passing off here at 9 o'clock and about uh, 12 at 31 westbound. Okay, sir, we'll take that from about uh, a little lower than up just went off our left wing. The Nighthawk reports an object passing off its left wing. America West 564 has the same experience moments later. The object moves dangerously close to both aircraft. 
the anxious America West crew contacts Albuquerque Air Traffic Control again. The object suddenly disappears from Flight 564's view. Then a concerned Albuquerque air traffic control contacts NORAD's Western Air Defense Sector Headquarters at McCord Air Force Base in Tacoma, Washington. I've got a, uh, something unusual, and I was wondering if you all have know of anything going on out here. I had a couple of aircraft reported something 300 to 400 foot long, cylindrical in shape with a strobe. Oh. At 30,000 feet. We don't have anything going on yeah. that I know of. This guy definitely saw it run all the way down the side of the airplane. It's right out of uh, the X-Files. I mean, it's a, it's a definite UFO or something like that. I, but, I mean, and, and, oh, y'all are serious about this. Yeah, he's real serious about it, too. And uh, he looked at it, saw it. Holy. Thirteen minutes later, Albuquerque Air Traffic Control checks in again with NORAD. Only this time, NORAD has something. We had someone call here earlier about a pilot uh, spotting an unidentified flying object. Yep, that's us. Okay, well, hey, we're tracking a, a search-only track kind of where that might have happened. We, um, we've been tracking it for about three, four minutes now. According to the official report, NORAD has denied this incident in writing. These were experienced airline pilots. They'd been flying thousands of hours. They were familiar with the sky. When they say something, you have to pay more attention to it. Coming up, the complete and uncut film of a dramatic 1979 UFO event over New Zealand. There's the best image right in there. And later, what did astronaut Catherine Coleman aboard Space Shuttle Flight STS-73 really see on October 21st, 1995? We have an unidentified flying object. A Melbourne, Australia television reporter said his crew filmed UFOs for seven minutes Saturday night over the eastern region of New Zealand's South Island. On December 21st, 1978, New Zealand cargo plane pilots John Randell and Keith Hine observed strange light phenomenon over the sea near the South Island of New Zealand. The objects are picked up as well by Wellington, New Zealand air traffic control radar and reports reach local media. Ten days later, on December 31st, producers at Australia's Channel 10 dispatch reporter Quentin Fogarty with a camera crew to attempt to find these same UFOs along the exact same flight path. And they do. Air traffic controllers were recording strange blips on their radar. Here is what reporter Quentin Fogarty said as he traced an airline flight that reported seeing UFOs last month. We're now in the radar room at Christchurch Airport. It's about uh, quarter to two, and in about another 20 minutes, uh, we intend to take off again in the Argosy and uh, retrace the route we took only a few moments earlier. Uh, we've just heard from Wellington radar that there are still targets in the Kaikoura area. So this time we're hoping to get better film than we did last time, and uh, all I can say is we'll see what happens. The New Zealand case is of considerable importance in the history of ufology because of the residue of information that's available afterwards. We have the film itself and the tape recordings made by Quentin Fogarty on the aircraft, and of prime importance is we have the tape recording made by the Wellington Air Traffic Control Center, and it provides a history of the sighting minute by minute. We're about now three minutes out of Christchurch Airport and on our starboard side we can see two very bright lights, one much brighter than the other and it's like a very, very bright star and just below it is another light not quite so bright. Just before midnight, Fogarty goes airborne with New Zealand cargo pilot Bill Stardup. The beginning of the flight is uneventful. Then at 12.05 a.m., Fogarty and the crew see strange lights and objects coming toward them from the right side of the plane. Fogarty turns on his camera and begins filming. Those two lights appear to be traveling with us. They're still off the starboard wing. The brighter light is still above the other and uh, it's moved a little further ahead of the other. It's extremely bright, much brighter than any of the other stars in the sky. Ground radar observes these objects and the control tower confirms the sighting and records the conversation. What follows is the actual audio of this unusually well-documented event. The 
captain startup recounts that the object or target is initially ahead of him then travels at an unbelievable speed past his left side he quickly banks the plane left in an attempt to make visual contact on the ground Wellington air traffic control radios a chilling message to the captain they have picked up yet another target on his left side and this one is closing in on the plane Captain Startup is able to get close enough to determine that the object is an array of bright blue lights pulsing at a rapid rate. To his shock, the object has gotten bigger. There was an interesting radar event where the uh, object, some object got so close to the aircraft that looked to Wellington radar as if the aircraft radar target image had doubled in size. Strong target, uh, right in formation with you now, uh, your target has doubled in size. The double sized target continues to appear on radar screens for 36 seconds, then returns back to normal size. Yeah, blue lights right there. This is the object which was uh, apparently traveling along with the aircraft. It was picked up on aircraft radar. Dr. Bruce Maccabee received a 16 millimeter copy of the Argosy UFO film directly from the Australian TV network in 1979. Roll four, take 10. This complete and unedited film has never been made available before. Experts believe that these images are the most comprehensive and frightening UFO evidence ever captured on film. This is the famous New Zealand film obtained uh, the night of December 31st, 1978. The cameraman is sitting in the seat between the pilot and the co-pilot. The image is dancing around because he was carrying it on his shoulder. They saw this light to their right. And this light, as time goes on, will fade in and out, takes on various shapes. This is the flashing light that you have to slow down and look at frame by frame to see what happens. When he goes from very bright white down to dim orange, you see the image went over to the side, then he turned the camera a little bit in order to pull it back into the center. That uh, other target that has been following us has now been joined by two others, so we now, at this stage, have uh, three unidentified flying objects just off our uh, right wing. And they've been following us, or one of them has been following us now for probably about 10 minutes. I, for one, am hoping really that uh, we've seen enough and that's the way it is or is it monday january 1st 1979 this is water Cron guide cbs news good night coming up while the apollo 11 astronauts were the first men to set foot on the moon they were not the first to make reports of sightings of the unknown in outer space Pilot sightings of UFOs are not exclusive to Earth's atmosphere. In the early 1960s, as America and the Soviet Union escalate the space race, astronauts and cosmonauts begin to witness strange and unexplained objects and events in outer space. You know, 1958, when NASA formed, they literally expected to make contact with extraterrestrial life. December 4th, 1965. Four hours and 24 minutes into the historic 14-day mission. The astronauts of Gemini 7, Frank Borman and James Lovell, both military test pilots, are performing routine tasks. Then suddenly, at 2234 Universal Time, as the capsule is high above Hawaii, both men see a bright object, or bogey, flying above their capsule. Borman radios mission control in Houston. What follows are the actual radio transmissions. Seven I seven carry with an IRA. Last clear. Seven, go ahead. I'm talking with ten o'clock I. This is Houston. Say again, seven. I'm talking with ten o'clock I. The recording suddenly ends. NASA insists the sighting is Gemini's Titan booster rocket. Lovell replies that he can see the booster as well as quote several actual sightings. I remember hearing this on my car radio, talked to NASA, and they confirmed that uh, that was the phrase used, we have a bogey in sight. 
In NASA's official Gemini 7 mission report, published in January 1966, no mention is ever made of the infamous bogey recording. Neither Lovell nor Borman have ever commented publicly on this message. But as far as the American public is concerned, NASA denies the very existence of UFOs they've been covering up since the dawn of spaceflight. From the early years of the space program, NASA was beset with sighting reports from astronauts. September 13, 1966. Gemini 11 astronauts Richard Gordon and Charles Pete Conrad see something strange on their 16th revolution of Earth, 27 hours and 47 minutes after takeoff. Conrad radios ground control. He reports he has just seen an unidentified object about 50 miles downrange. It is metallic and revolving at more than one revolution per second. He then pulls out a camera and snaps three photographs. It drops down in front of them before quickly disappearing. Seen here are the actual photographs taken by Conrad aboard Gemini 11. And NORAD said that the only thing that they could imagine it was, was a booster from a Russian satellite. The NASA people threw out the NORAD explanation almost immediately. The Gemini 11 case is the only one that NASA considers to be unidentified. Gemini 11, however, was not the last NASA mission to have alleged encounters with UFOs. In fact, more and more UFO sightings were reported as Gemini opened the door to the Apollo program. The Apollo astronauts in particular were trailed by UFOs. It is alleged that Neil Armstrong, you know, saw UFOs. Many of the astronauts did, but they won't talk about it publicly yet, but they might. Listen, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. The famous Apollo 11 mission reportedly experienced objects tracking the capsule, as well as objects that were photographed by the astronauts on the lunar surface. Four months later, on November 14, 1969, Apollo 12 commander Pete Conrad reports back to NASA that he sees an unidentified object out his window. An object which is in the same place all the time but appears to be tumbling. Well, we've had it ever since yesterday. It just seems to be tagging along with us. While the object is widely considered to be debris falling from the booster, many researchers remain skeptical. They suggest such an object would be incapable of tracking a fast-moving space capsule for an extended period of time. As the Apollo missions open the door to the space shuttle program, experts are convinced the door was also open to an increased level of UFO activity in outer space. In 1981, NASA initiates the space shuttle program, and with it, an unprecedented wave of UFO sightings, including astounding audio and video evidence. One highly controversial recording emerges from STS-29, a space shuttle discovery flight on March 13, 1989. Astronaut John Blaha reports the sighting of something unusual. One of the NASA transmissions that wasn't successfully sanitized back in 1989 one of the astronauts on a space shuttle said, we're still looking at the aliens. It was as plain as day. The following recording was reportedly intercepted by a ham radio operator in Maryland. To this day, NASA has neither confirmed nor denied the validity of this transmission. The space shuttle has two radio channels. One is a public channel that we all hear when NASA is broadcasting, we can hear what the astronauts are saying. The other channel is a Department of Defense encrypted channel, and that's where I believe the real conversations are going on. The new millennium ushered in more UFO sightings by NASA shuttle crews. One extraordinary recording occurred aboard space shuttle flight STS-73. Mission specialist Catherine Coleman sees something curious on day three of the routine 15-day mission. This is October 21st, 1995. We have an unidentified flying object. And nothing after. I mean, there she is. Catherine's just floating around in there. And that's where I believe they went on to the Department of Defense encrypted channel on the space shuttle, and they continued the conversation. Researcher David Sereda has been studying unusual phenomenon in outer space for over a decade. It is his theory that NASA continued recording, but on a secret frequency, leaving us with more questions than answers. We have an unidentified flying object. 
Even recent shuttle missions have had eerie reports and sightings of strange objects. According to Sereda, some of the most shocking evidence of UFOs in outer space comes as recently as August 6, 2005, from Space Shuttle Flight STS-114. Well, the space shuttle is doing 18,000 miles an hour around the Earth. So the object is traveling obviously much faster than 18,000 miles an hour to catch up to the shuttle, to fly in tandem speed with it, and then it takes off and goes back out the other way. This is real footage from the space shuttle. Even considering that it may be just a few miles away from the space shuttle, it's obviously a, a very large UFO. The object enters quickly, dramatically changes speed and direction, then flies back out of frame. The trajectory and speed of the object defy all laws of physics, leaving researchers like Sereda to draw their own conclusions. When you zoom in on video frames or any digital media, you get pixelation. So some of the rectangular shapes you see are pixels, but notice also you can see the round aura of light around it. So you can still differentiate shapes within the pixels. There's no way that's dust and debris. There's no way it's another satellite. When you go through process of elimination, you know that what we're seeing in STS-114 is truly a UFO. There's really nothing else out there like that. Since NASA does not comment on the topic of UFOs, the authenticity of space recordings and sightings cannot be officially confirmed, which leaves many questions unanswered. UFOs constantly trailed our spaceships around planet Earth, the space shuttle, but more importantly, all the Apollo, the Project Apollo spacecraft on the way to the moon. I think a lot of astronauts are going to start coming forward and testifying to what they have seen. My impression is that uh, the guys who go running around saying the NASA stuff proves something are hyping it. As Earth's airspace grows more and more crowded each day, and more people than ever take to the skies, is it possible that reports like the ones you've just seen will continue? There are reams and reams of official reports by commercial aircraft, by private aircraft, and military aircraft about pilot encounters. Even if, while we're sitting right here in California, a UFO turned up over Santa Monica Bay, you probably hear a great explanation of how it was a reflection of the sun behind the cloud. So many reports from so many experienced pilots of strange phenomenon and frightening encounters with UFOs since the beginning of man flight. As our pilots fly through Earth's atmosphere and further into space, many continue to wonder, do the skies truly belong to us or to them? Half a million acres of land, thousands of workers, billions of dollars in development, schools, stores, movie theaters, and still, no one knew it existed. The biggest